No, see, I, I didn't know what, what kind of stories you want to hear, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We're just... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's May 14th, 2005, and we're here in Orange County, California, conducting uh, interviews for the Veterans History Project. Thank you for being with us today. And um, if I could have you state your name and spell it for the record. Uh, I'm known as Jim Law. Actually, my name is James Law. Last name is Law, L-A-W. Okay, James. And can you tell me um, what branch of the service were you in? I was a United States Marine. Okay, from what years? Uh, from 1937 to 1967. So I take it you're a retired Marine Corps. I'm a retired Marine, right. Okay. And you were in uh, World War II as well as Korean War? Yes, I served in both wars. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit, what did you do during your career in the Marine Corps? Well, I started out in the infantry, uh, which is a, a foot soldier, a foot Marine. Uh, but I always had a desire. I wanted to be a pilot. It took me several years. And I was down in... Guantanamo Bay in Cuba with the Marines in 1940. Uh, they formed the 1st Marine Division down there, and I was transferred from uh, the 5th Marines, which I belonged to. They formed a new organization called the 7th Marines. Uh, I went into that, and we were uh, training by packs and rifles, humping up and down over the hills every day. It was kind of warm even in, in February. Anyway, I got transferred into this uh, new organization, and I went up to the first sergeant and said, Top, I said, I'd like to get into aviation, become a pilot, so I'd like to request a transfer to aviation. Uh, will you help me write a letter requesting that? And he says, oh, sure, Sonny, uh, I'll help you out. He says, come along with me. He took me by the arm and he marched me down to the mess hall and said to the mess sergeant, this young fellow just volunteered for 30 days of mess duty. And... <laughs> My job there was peeling spuds, peeling. We had no machines then. We were, it was all peeling by hand. And uh, because I was a private first class at the time, they put me in charge of uh, seven other men, and we sat in a tent all day long and, and peeled potatoes. And the first sergeant would say, or the mess sergeant would say, hey, I need about uh, 12 GI cans full of dice spuds for breakfast, and you'll work as long as you have to. Sometimes it would be... 10 or 11 o'clock at night before we get the cans full and ready to, to quit. Anyway, that's, uh, that started. Uh, I finished my 30 days of mess duty and went back to the first sergeant and said, okay, you had your fun, now how about help me? He says, okay, come along with me. And he marched me back down to the mess hall and said, this young fellow liked it so much that he wants 30 more days of peeling spuds. Oh, no. And I had my second month there peeling spuds. When I went back to him the third time, he, he helped me write the letter requesting my transfer to aviation duty, and it happened. It happened. Within a, a week, I was transferred, to, which was right there, in, uh, in still at, at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Mm -hmm. But I got the start, and I went into aircraft maintenance at that time. And, of course, I, I was a little bit of a mechanic, you know. I had learned how to take care of my own Model A Ford, uh, 1931 Ford, so I knew a little bit about engines and how to use tools and stuff, so... I fit right in the, into that. So. That's great. And so um, you were um, an aircraft mechanic in World War II. Two, yes. As well as the Korean War. Yes. Okay. And um, when you were over in, where were you in World War II? Uh, out in the Solomon Islands. Um, uh, started out in uh, a group of islands called the New Hebrides, uh, which was a little bit south of... Uh, uh, Guadalcanal, and we spent time back and forth between the New Hebrides, which is the headquarters, and the Guadalcanal, uh, which was uh, the lower end of the Solomon Islands. And from there on up, there was a chain of islands up, uh, up in through, uh, heading towards in the in the direction of Japan, okay. heading into the North Pacific. Now, where were you when Pearl Harbor was bombed? Uh, on December 7th in 1941, I was back in the Marine base at Quantico, Virginia, which is about 50 miles south of Washington, D.C. I was preparing to uh, go into uh, 
uh, Washington, D.C. with some friends of mine where we had some uh, a dinner engagement for some uh, beautiful young ladies who were going to cook us a home-cooked meal. And I was laying on my bunk uh, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon just waiting to go listening to a football game. And I can't even remember the names of the, the teams were playing. Uh, when the announcement just came in uh, over it that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed, uh, within a matter of uh, two minutes, why uh, we were ordered to fall out in front of the barracks. The officer of the day announced, gentlemen, he said, we are at war, govern yourself accordingly, report to your duty stations. And we did that, uh, prepared, uh, prepared to uh, move our craft, uh, spread them out in possibility of an air attack, which we didn't really think that, that we were in danger of that, but that was the instruction to move the, the aircraft, spread them out. And we worked all night long, and we were told to start packing our gear because, and when I say gear, I mean tools and equipment and, and things that we needed for, for that, Get, getting your aircraft ready to, to move out because we knew we'd be going someplace. And we were. Within, uh, within 48 hours, we, we were loading up, loading up onto a, a troop transport uh, with all of our equipment, all of our tools, and in the coaches for a trip across country to the West Coast, out to California. time right after Pearl Harbor you were actually back east and they had blackouts that the blackouts were right right here on the whole west oh, coast was west coast. the whole west coast was uh, blacked out because they were afraid of uh, a bombing attack and uh, uh, any lights would give the enemy if they were to come this way to give them an idea of these are houses and things so uh, automobiles could not drive with headlights at night uh, People could not, all the windows had to be shaded uh, and doors, double, uh, double curtains and so on to keep any light from uh, showing where there was residences. Mm -hmm. And that was, for several months that was true because they didn't, uh, they were really afraid that the Japanese had the ability to attack our west coast. Mm -hmm. And did you see combat? Uh, I, I think you'd call it combat, yes. Uh, that was the Guadalcanal, Battle of Guadalcanal was in the Solomon Islands, was the first, uh, first real battle, a turning point, where the United States forces would seize a Japanese-held real estate or a Japanese-held island. From there on, it was a matter of uh, island by island uh, hopping towards, uh, which we knew was going to be the eventual uh, having to be landing in, in Japan itself. So we at Guadalcanal, all we had uh, was the airfield. Uh, there it was a small, small area. It was held by that with just a circle of Marines around to hold the Japanese forces. They were all over the island, and they wanted the island. They wanted the airfield. We needed the airfield, and we were able to hold it. Uh, it was bombing, almost daily bombing, uh, by the Japanese aircraft coming in there. And also the fleet would come in quite often, cruisers and destroyers, battleships, and throw shells in trying to destroy and uh, get rid of it. The Japanese were continually trying to retake the airfield, so it was a nip and tuck situation for a long time. Very scary. I, I take it, um, did you have any, any friends that did not come home? Yes, yeah, so of course, so we always hated to see that, but... Uh, uh, Almost every mission where the aircraft uh, would go out, one or two of them wouldn't always return. Uh, yeah, there's uh, uh, some good friends of mine were killed in Japanese uh, shelling there uh, at night. Uh, we don't like to think about that. Uh, we always have the idea that it's, it's the other person. We don't like to lose friends, but it's not going to be me. It's going to be somebody else. Uh, so none of us would... Uh, admit we were in, in real danger. Sure. And I see that um, when, and when you were in the Korean War, where were you stationed over in Korea? Uh, I was, uh, we left for Korea about uh, two weeks after the Korean War started. I was stationed at uh, El Toro Marine Air Base uh, right here in Orange County and uh, President Truman ordered the the Marines to go out there to see what they could salvage. Yeah, we were on the way, uh, 
and it was almost a, a three-week trip by troop transport out to Korea. Made a short stop in in Japan, and then we participated in the landing at Incheon, uh, which was General MacArthur, who was the commander in chief of the uh, Allies out there. Uh, his brilliant move, his staff, Washington D.C., the Pentagon, everybody said that uh, it would be impossible to make a landing. At Incheon, because the tides are as a 24-foot tide daily, twice a day, and there's no way that no way that any any navy could make an amphibious landing there. And he says, "Well, that's the reason we're going to do it because nobody believes it can be done." And he sent his Marines in there, and we did land there. And they, when in a few days later they were attacking Seoul, which is the capital, seized the capital of Seoul back again, put it in the. Uh, the hands of the Japan of the friendly Korean force, the South Koreans, and then he made the decision to send us up into North Korea, which was against uh, the best judgment of a lot of people, and that's when uh, the Marines were up there at the Chosin Reservoir, and that's when uh, getting close to the Chinese border and the Chinese uh, army entered there. So uh, the Marines found uh, a division of Marines found themselves surrounded by uh, nine divisions of uh, Chinese. Uh, MacArthur wouldn't admit there were any Chinese in the war, but uh, <laughs> eventually he had to accept that. And now, I, I also noticed that you're wearing the nice hat, and you have lots of different um, uh, medals on that. Can you tell us uh, a little bit what this hat represents and organizations that you're involved in uh, since your retirement? This this cap, we don't call it a hat, but anyway, okay. this cap is, is a, the uniform cap for the American Legion which I've been an active member of the American Legion for a long time. I also belong to uh, many other veterans organizations, such as the, uh, the Marine Corps League, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the AMVETS, the Fleet Reserve Association, and, and some more organizations. The, they're not really medals. They're pins, uh, uh, different insignia from the different organizations that I belong to uh, at different times. They're not. Uh, medals for heroism or anything like that. Sometimes they have uh, different pins for different conventions or different periods that we have, yes. But you're strongly involved in, in those organizations. Yes, I'm involved in all of them because I like it uh, and I think they're important to give. give uh, we think that the veterans organizations are able to uh, take care, the primary job is to take care of veterans to help those that are not as lucky as we are, and there's a lot of them that are laying in hospitals and, and need help, and also we feel numbers of memberships help influence Congress to, uh, to give us the benefits that we were uh, supposed to be entitled to as veterans. Very well said. Well, thank you very much, James. Um, I wish we can talk to you a little bit longer, but we need to, to stop, but we appreciate your coming in and uh, giving us the time and telling us some of your stories. Well, I am enjoying it. You know, they, they say Marines enjoy telling sea stories, <laughs> so that's a sea story, some of these that and I've been telling you. Real quick again, why did you enlist in the Marine Corps versus any other branch? Well, I've always wanted to be the best there and, and the best organization, and <laughs> it still is. And you know, once a Marine, always a Marine. That's what I hear. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. It was very pleasant talking to you.